Or has it changed? She comes to the ER, the first thing I say is, where's her medication list? I don't know this lady from a Adam. I said, where's her medication list? EMT hands me a thing. I wrote them over here, Doc. I say to the medics, did you guys look at this? Oh, uh, no. Okay. I said, what did you give her? They gave her atropine for her heart rate. Didn't work. Why didn't it work? Can you read that? Katie and Verapamil low pressor. She was on a few other things, but they were insignificant. So they gave her atropine because her heart rate was 26. Pupils were pinpoint. Tell me what cadian is, what verapamil is, what lopressor is. Don't, no, no, don't tell me now. Put it in your note. So, what did I do for her? I gave her three drugs. And within three minutes, she had a heart rate of 80. Her pressure was 140 over 72, and she was awake. What did I give her? Nope. Not, there was no drips. Just three IV push drugs to bring her vital sign, signs up to normal. So that's, that's your project. That's your project for next, uh, next time. You want the page before this? Yeah, sorry I write kind of shitty, but we're not teaching cursive anymore in school, so I'm trying to regret, regress back to my elementary years. By the way, the EMS people up there are fire EMS, so it's not just, it's not two separate systems. They still bring people in on backboards, which, when was the last time we did that, other than a tough extrication? How, how, how many times do we bring people in on backboards anymore? It depends if we've got to get them out of a tight space. Right, and, and that's, that's, that's acceptable. I mean, that's the way the paper was written. But it's not a standard. A 90-year-old on a backboard because they fell at the nursing home and they have no complaints, is that appropriate? No, no, no. I mean, you know it's going to happen to them. Okay, you guys got this? What's the report say? What is, what is patient on? Ah. What is patient on? What, what, what meds would you think they were taking? Of course, next page, I tell you some of them, so. But it's just causing you to think. I asked for a list of those meds. Somebody mentioned DIG, somebody else beta blockers. What the treatment would be if it was whatever that you're putting in the list. Your differential, how does it change? These are the meds she is on. So even though you see the progression here, I don't want you answering four questions before this with information I've given you down here. Okay, this is to make you think. This is to show you the progression, and I want you to think, because each stage should be independent. When you get new information, then you'll change your differential, and that's the way it is in real life. You know, I had the benefit of knowing what the drugs were and what she was on, because the EMT actually had written them down that nobody looked at his, his note. So I had that added benefit. Interestingly, after I woke her up, 
I went to the medical records and pulled up her previous visits. The last two visits were for the same thing, and nobody addressed the issue. They talked about putting a pacemaker in her. Oh, I forgot. They, they did put a pacemaker on her. There was no capture. So you can add that to the intubation. You can add pacemaker with no capture. And actually, I think her IV was a, I think it was an IO in the left shoulder. They, they do a lot of IOs up there, a lot of them. I had a cardiac arrest the other day with two of them, one in the shoulder, one in the tibia. He had been dead for an hour and a half. Okay, let's see, intubator and pacemaker. Forgot that. No capture. Just remember, pacer, no capture. <coughs> Okay, and we'll look at that next month. All right, uh, should I get started on this or should we just take a five? Let's just take a five minute break because I, I don't want to start and then stop. What? Oh, I thought you were talking to me. Okay. Um, so in keeping with uh, an attempt to go back to basic stuff to, to help you understand what you're looking at in terms of the physiology of the disease processes, uh, we're going to look at some pathophysiology for a couple of lectures, and uh, then we're going to get into some uh, pharmacology, because it seems that the weaknesses that are prevalent in the uh, uh, pre-hospital agencies deal with understanding the physiology of disease and understanding pharmacology and, and how these things work. So we're going to be spending some time with that. I don't see any reason in giving you a lecture on TPA of acute stroke when number one, you don't deal with it because that's, that's in hospital uh, treatment. And number two, you need to understand what's going on to understand why the TPA works or doesn't work. So, we're going to go back to basics and move forward again. Part of understanding disease and the treatment of those diseases is knowing what happens to the normal physiology of the body. I've always said that you need to know normal in order to know when something isn't normal. Uh, just like in medical school, you start with stuff that is the standard basic functioning of the cell in the body. And then they build on that. The problem is that a lot of times they build it in systems and sometimes it's hard to understand. More so when they deal with pharmacology uh, because they do it by, by grouping. So in other words, let's take Valium. They'll say benzodiazepines and they throw all the benzos into that class of drugs. Valium, Versed, Ativan, the main ones that we deal with in the field. But they don't teach Valium, they teach benzodiazepines. So you have to know the class of the drug you're dealing with because you'll learn the class, you don't learn the individual drug. A little easier when you're in the clinical realm because there's certain drugs that are used all the time and you can learn about that particular drug and then if you know what it is, you can apply that to the other drugs that are similar to it. So sometimes it's a little easier to study one drug than it is to try to study a whole class. Okay? Anyway. What we look at in diseases is what happens at the cellular level because a lot of our medications and a lot of our disease processes occur at that level. They talk about different processes that the body uh, initiates for various reasons. Here, it's, we're, we're going to go through most of these fairly quick because it's not what I want to talk about and it's not that important. Uh, they, they talk about how the cells can change either uh, get smaller, become diseased, or physiologically change from either the disease or in an attempt to reverse that, that uh, disease process. They talk about the hypertrophy and the hyperplasia, how this changes the, the structure of the cell, and that's all well and good. Did 
just replace this battery and already it's doing this. Makes no sense to me sometimes. Um, adaptation, dysplasia, the change in cell. So when you look at a cancer cell, what is it, what's commonly the, the uh, finding that the, the pathologist says they're dysplastic, okay? And that's what it means. There's something that's not normal about it. It's changed in size, shape, or the structure of it. That's okay. I'll test you on this in particular. Of course, there'd be nobody left in here. <laughs> Only one crew. All right, so you guys will get the A's then. Okay, so then they talk about metaplasia. Yeah, okay. Now, this is more important, okay, because this is really what we deal with acutely most of the time. When, when you get a call, you're dealing with injury of the organism, and the organism meaning the human body that we deal with. You're dealing with some kind of injury or disease mechanism, and a lot of these uh, mechanisms are fairly similar, okay? So we know that hypoxia causes cell death, right? And it causes what kind of, of acid-base disturbance? It's going to cause a metabolic acidosis, okay? So even if you don't think of metabolic, it's acidotic. That's what happens. And we talk about hypoxic injury, and this gives you some uh, explanations of what happens. Your blood can be reduced, okay, which is, comes from what? Blood loss, anemia, okay? Your hemoglobin can be lost, which comes again from blood loss or anemia. You can have red blood cell reduction, which is anemia, specifically. And then you have problems with respiratory in the heart being ineffective in its ability to exchange the gases and get rid of the acid and buffer the, uh, uh, the body's uh, metabolic systems. Um, you know that respiratory hypoxia, we see that in various diseases. We see it in COPDers, we can see it in sepsis and pneumonias, there's all kinds of causes for it. Cardiovascular ineffectiveness, patients in heart failure, patients septic, low output states. So these all result in the same thing. So what I'm saying to you is acutely, almost everybody has a hypoxic chemistry in their body. Almost everybody with an illness that you see acutely in extremis is hypoxic for one reason or another, whether it's from a respiratory issue, uh, a vo blood volume issue, a, a hemoglobin issue, it's going to result in the same kind of process. They're going to be acidotic. Chemical injuries, we may not see as commonly because when you say chemical injuries, people think of the toxins, okay? But actually, regular medications can cause chemical injuries. You do, you know, you overdose on some medications and you can get damage to the cell wall. You can get screw-ups in sodium and water and calcium. So it's not just related to toxic or enviro environmental toxicities, okay? So what things do you think chemically would, would screw up your sodium and water and calcium? Yeah. Okay, so diuretics. Same with uh, blood pressure medication. Yeah, blood pressure pills can, depending on, on what kind they are. Uh, only like the glycosides and those things. Sodium channel blockers, calcium channel blockers. And they don't have to necessarily be overdoses in the sense of we think of overdoses. They could just be a little more medication than that patient can tolerate because of their right. renal problems. Yeah. And then, of course, we have infection, bacteria, viruses, fungi, but, of course, infectious usually with us and our patient population is usually going to be related to uh, bacterial infections, pneumonias, uh, sepsis from uh, the urinary tract, you know, very common in our patient population. So that's what we see. Yeah, we, we have a septic alert. Yeah. But there's certain criteria it's supposed right. to meet. 
They're supposed to be hypotensive, tachycardic, and have a fever over 101.8. Now, they call a sepsis alert for stuff that doesn't meet those criteria. And I'm going to say this because you know how cynical I am. They do it because there's a payment difference. It's not because there's a treatment difference, because they call a sepsis alert and nothing changes. We don't get additional staff. We don't get patients pushed to the front of the line for admission. We don't get x-ray actually looking at a film. So the whole purpose of it is if they document it in the record, sepsis alert, they get extra money for that. Yeah, I don't think that that's in there. You know, I haven't looked at it in like a year, and I don't think that's in there. I, I'm getting the PowerPoint, and I'll, and I'll check it. Through. Yeah, that's uh, okay. I'll take a look at it. Uh, there's, it's basically probably the same at each institution with some minor changes. Uh, at our institution, if you call a sepsis alert, you're supposed to have a central line in the patient. Well, none of our hospitalists put in central lines. Uh, none of the ER doctors other than me put in central lines. So, therefore, they very rarely get a central line. What do they do? They call x-ray for the interventional radiologist to put in a line. They call the PIC team to put in a line. Well, you know that's not going to be immediate. It may take an hour for them to do that. So there are parameters that you're supposed to follow. I don't know if it really makes a difference in outcome, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I, I don't know what they said at the... Uh, course, but... It, just, it was just saying about the same thing that you've always said, recognition of sepsis. I mean, and one of his things is, is you can't overload them with fluid. If you think that you are, we can change that at the ER. If you think this person is sepsis, they've, they've shown studies that give over six liters of fluid That's right. in the field, because if it goes anywhere else, they can give them a diuretic. They, right. can, they can do these things when they get to the ER. Error on the side of that. It's, it's easier... Right. It's easier to get the fluid off them than to put the fluid into them and get their pressures up. And the problem is that, and, and I had a patient that I'm going to use as one of the case studies. The problem is that they use pressors in a patient whose volume contracted and they worsen their acidosis. What does a presser do peripherally to your tissue? It constricts your vessels, therefore causing hypoxia to the tissue. So if you have a patient who has a low BP and he's volume contracted, Giving him a pressure to raise his blood pressure is not going to help. You need to give him fluid. And that's what they were saying in this lecture was you've got to have a balance of both. You've got a, you've got a container problem and also a volume problem. Right. So you've got to add more volume and also at the same time shrink your container. Yeah. Okay, so infectious, again, an, a, an issue in cell injury. So... What does it look like? What do you see when you see these patients? You know, when, when we say, uh, when, when you, you get a call for a patient who is altered mental status, 80 years old in a nursing home, and has a history of incontinence, uh, and you, f you walk in the room and they smell like urine, and you figure that they have a urinary tract infection or septic because their pressure's low and they have a fever of 102, what does it look like at the cellular level that's causing you to see what you see at the gross uh, organism level or the gross system level, okay? So you have a lot of things going on and, and think of it this way as to what happens because this will help you understand how to treat these things. They talk about anabolism and catabolism. You guys know what that is? Okay. Yeah, basically, real simply, anabolism is a, is a building up of the tissue, if you will, okay? Catabolism is a breaking down of that tissue. You get cellular swelling, and, and that can come from a lot of different things. It can come from infection, can come from tissue death at the cellular level, because what happens to that junk, that, that the, the destruction of the, uh, of the uh, tissue in a cell, of, of the living organism in the cell, what happens to it? You build up toxins, the cell swells, you have to get those toxins out of that cell. Lipid accumulation, those are your fats and fatty acids. Again, it comes from damage to that cell. They leak out into the system. And then systemic manifestations are things you can see swelling, uh, peripheral edema, <coughs> fever, 
Uh, you could see uh, low output states, so hypotension. You can see respiratory problems, either in tachypnea or, or uh, uh, hypopnea, where they're not breathing. So these are all manifestations of the organism as a whole of something going on at the very basic cellular level. This just talks about death and uh, uh, of, of the cell. You don't need to worry about that, really. Uh, I'm just going to mention this briefly because these are the different types of necrosis of tissue, of cell tissue in uh, living organisms. And we see uh, gangrene, which is a combination of liquefactive, actually, and a little bit of uh, coagulative. But these are different types of necroses that are related to the type of tissue that's involved with it, whether it's connective tissue, muscle tissue, fat tissue. Yeah, well, that's, that's just a way of blowing off the toxins. That's really what it is. It's, it's a way of blowing off the toxins, the waste products of death, of metabolism. You know, but see, you know when you get a patient who's near death, because they have a smell about them. You know, they have a funny smell, and you say, whoa. They, you say, oh, okay, this isn't good. So that's cell death that you're smelling. That's why when I talk about examining a patient, walking into the room, taking in everything visually, listening, smelling, and sometimes that smell transfers to a taste. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the environment of a cell, we all know this, that you need fluid and electrolyte balance, uh, that you have water movement between the cells and in and out of the cells, and these are different ways of fluids moving in and out of the cells. It's also different ways for medications to move in and out of the cell. And they talk about diffusion, osmosis. Not really important that you know how each of them works, just that you know that it does work. Uh, now. We talk about pressures when we talk about using PEEP or CPAP in the field, okay? And how does CPAP work? What does it do? Keep the pressure constant. The, uh, okay. The so it keeps the pressure against that fluid which has been leaking into the interstitial tissue in the lung and it builds a pressure wall against it so that tissue or that fluid has to stay in the tissue and in the circulation. So that's theoretically how it works. And they do it by raising that that pressure inside your uh, uh, tracheal bronchial tree. And by raising that pressure, it prevents that transmission of fluid across the cellular membranes. So you have different mechanisms, okay? Some, some are normal, okay? Filtration, uh, osmotic pressures, oncotic pressures, membrane permeabilities. I always use the example as a patient with ascites. What happens in ascites? Why do they get a big belly? They leak that fluid from their peritoneal membrane. We use the peritoneal membrane in patients to dialyze them with what's called peritoneal dialysis. They put a catheter in here, it goes right into their abdominal cavity, and they put in dialysate solutions to exchange with their, uh, uh, their blood, and they do it through that membrane, the peritoneal lining, because it will exchange electrolytes and waste products of metabolism, because it's, it's that type of semi-permeable membrane that you can do that with, okay? So that's an alternative to hemodialysis, but not in all patients, only in some. And, the, and it comes from a combination of the membrane permeability, the pressures inside, and the fluid pHs uh, and size of the molecules to pull poisons out of the system. Only problem is that you also get a reverse flow into the system, and you can actually overhydrate a patient and put them into heart failure. We usually use it and take them out of heart failure, but it's also possible to put them into heart failure because you can give them too much fluid and too much of it will seep across that membrane. <laughs> it depends on the, on the solution that they're using, but it does happen. I have seen it. They talk about edema. We all know that these things that we talked about here, we looked at here, okay, all contribute to edema. Physiologically and mechanically, you have different causes for it. Lymphatic obstruction. Give me an example of somebody with lymphatic obstruction. You've all seen this a hundred times. That's the elephant leg stuff, isn't it? Yeah, that's called anasarca. It's lymphedema. Okay. 
you can see that in patients who are overweight, who have some uh, uh, liver disease. But the most common way you see lymphatic obstruction is in breast cancer patients who've had a lot of nodes removed. And they come in and their one arm is always swollen. Okay, so that's, that's what you see as the most common. So when you think of lymphatic and obstruction, think of that breast cancer patient. Think of that patient with giant legs who's, you know, 350 pounds and doesn't get around much and sits in a chair with her legs dangling all the time. And lymph runs along with the blood vessels, but it is not uh, uh, draining into the same places. It goes up to the thoracic duct in your neck or in your upper chest, and that's where all the lymph fluid goes and gets emptied into the vascular circulation, the venous circulation. <coughs> Electrolytes, we all know they're important. Um, some of the way the meds work, and in this recent example you had today, uh, you need to know how these electrolytes work to understand why the treatment is what it is in this situation that we've had earlier. And we'll get to that next month when we talk about what this patient had and what they needed. So you know that your electrolytes, sodium, chloride, uh, we should have calcium, potassium. All right, well, we'll, we'll talk about that too. Uh, sodium is one of the main ones that we deal with. You get a patient who is, a, and you see this in the old patients all the time, they're either complaining of weakness or they're kind of irritable and crotchety. Uh, you always need to check their electrolytes. Frequently their sodium's low. How low does a sodium have to get for them to have seizures? Because low sodiums do cause seizures, about 109. How low do they have to get for them to feel weak and like they can't get up? About 125. So there are certain cutoffs for certain kinds of symptoms. Chlorides, uh, they really move along with sodium. Uh, so whatever sodium does, the chlorides are going to be involved with it to some extent. Gives you a range. I, I understand you don't measure these, so that's not important really. Uh, do understand that there are hormones, and that's what these are, aldosterone, renin, natriuretic. These are hormones in the body that are used, that the kidney uses to help maintain fluid and electrolyte balance. And uh, this is what will be on the test for your certification exam, so make sure you understand that. Uh, we talk about alterations in sodium chloride and water balance. What kinds of clinical Situations that you see. I was just kidding about that chart, by the way. <laughs> you got guys right. <laughs> like, <laughs> look in here. <laughs> I wouldn't ask you that. That's that's stupid. I mean, what would be the point? I mean, really? It's great to look at and maybe develop an understanding for the uh, angiotensin, uh, uh, renin angiotensin uh, mechanism, how it works in the kidneys, but. It helps you understanding maybe how ACE inhibitors work, but it's not important to what you really need to do. So alterations in sodium chloride and water balance. What are the most common things you think we see? What's a common alteration? Dehydration. There you go. Our probably number one thing we see in these old people, along with their other diseases, is they're dehydrated. And that's an alteration in sodium and chloride and water balance. Your ratio changes, OK? So that, if somebody says to you, well, give me an example of an alteration in, in uh, sodium and uh, water balance, you should pop into your head dehydration. So we had the other day a cancer patient, and obviously going through the chemo. But he had gone through about Friday prior, I'd say four or five days prior. It seemed like it just took that long for it to get to him. He had that general weakness type thing. Uh, you know, it wasn't anything really significant, but he just said, he couldn't get up and when he tried to do a tilt test with him. He, uh, he just said, he said, it was, I, I, I can't stand up. And, you know, so obviously, but do you think it was more just related to the chemo affecting him? Um, it, 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 chemo is a little different, okay, in the sense that chemo is a poison. All chemo is a poison. And what does it do? It kills all replicating cells. So if you're killing all replicating cells, you're not just going to kill cancer cells. You're going to kill every cell. And by doing that, those structures in your body that replicate fairly actively and frequently uh, are going to be impacted more. So you lose your hair, your skin sloughs, 
if you, if you ever look at a chemo patient, they look younger, believe it or not, because what happens, all that old skin has been sloughing off them, and the newer, younger skin, so to speak, 